Good. Hi, everyone. So just a bit of context, I'm a research associate at my society. So what I've sort of been doing for the last 18 months since I've started is go through a lot of our old data to A, understand it myself, and B, sort of work through how it can be made accessible to other people, what's actually in there that we don't know about. And what, apart from the big data sets like the Fix My Street stuff that's been running for a while, we have been asking people survey questions since the beginning. And some of these questions have been sitting there collecting data comfortably for a decade without just really looking into what they were saying. Uh, so here is sort of 10 years looking at uh, Fix My Street and write to them. We've been asking when people either uh, use one of these services, we asked them two questions. For Fix My Street, we asked them if this is the first time reporting a problem, making a problem, and if it's the first time, um, and if the problem was fixed after about a month. So this sort of gives us uh, information in two directions. One is, is what kind of person is making this request? Is this someone who's already reporting lots or is this someone who's been activated by the service? And the other is sort of a measure of the response, uh, responsiveness of the authority. So the first question sort of gets at the sort of old debate in uh, sort of generally with the civic tech and the internet sphere is, does the technology mobilize uh, new people to take advantage of it by lowering the costs of access services, or does it reinforce people who already had greater access but now lowers the cost in general? And the answer we generally find by subdividing this data is, of course, it's both in different times. So uh, to look at the, so in this question, I'm not so concerned about the authority question. I'm going to look at just if a person has previously responded. So just to give some context on uh, Fix My Street, uh, this is the number of reports going on by year. Uh, so generally, it's, it's declining a bit towards the present day, but the early years are very, very insubstantial compared to the present day. So the next graph shows us how many for each year people uh, report, sorry, respondents to the survey said they had previously reported. So in the first few years, we have massive amounts of people, 60% of the people are saying they had previously made a report, and then as the number of people increases, the, we're getting more and more people who have never made a report get into the system, and that slowly creeps back up. So in general, I tend to ignore those first few years because they obviously stand out and say between uh, 50 and 60% of people are, n have never made a report before. That's not just through Fix My Street, but that's to their council in general. That's how the question's phrased. Uh, we can separately examine if they've used Fix My Street report. So essentially, roughly speaking, half of the people in any year have not reported a problem to the council before. Uh, but this is sort of unevenly among categories. So certain categories are more likely to report it as a first-time problem, and others are more likely to come up by repeat users. So first, looking at people who are... Uh, hang on, I had notes on that. Yes. So uh, similarly, by sort of analysing which ones... Uh, were more likely to be reported by first-time people, parking problems, abandoned vehicles, dogways, street lighting problems. So these are the sort of things that people are likely to encounter and report once, with parking standing out absolutely enormously. So that's like issues with uh, you know, parking being blocked, parking being inaccessible. That is the number one thing people who are reporting for the first time. And then often, because of the power drop-off, never reporting again. That are very few, um, the, the average across the site is about two reports, and that is mostly a normal number of people are only reporting one thing ever, and it will likely be one of these. Uh, the next thing is that uh, certain things are reported quite serially uh, by like graffiti, uh, litter, fly tipping, street cleaning. These are people who are often reporting these quite a lot. Uh, so they sort of have it in there. One of the interesting things that drops out the data set is like there is an ability to report a missed bin collection. But actually looking at the data, it's a small amount of users like reporting. So you, your bin collection every week, if you report it when it's missing like five times a year over 10 years, it stands out in the data. But that's because you as an individual are reporting your bin being missing a lot. So that can stand out in the data quite a bit. So basically people who are new to the service, new to reporting problems, act in quite a different way. Uh, so using the same sort of thing, looking at right to them, we can sort of, uh, so in this case, we can look at uh, both questions. So uh, the first was, so just to give an example of the scope of right to them, it's hard to get a, a rough idea of how many people write to their MP in the UK. The Hansard Society sort of estimate in the last year, 12% of the pop, uh, adult population wrote to their MP, which seems very high to me, but that's the number we have. And so working from that right to them accounts for just under 1%-ish using incredibly rough numbers. So almost all people writing to their MP are not doing it through right to them, but enough are that it, it matters to an extent and we get a reasonably um, wide sample on it. So uh, we asked them if their representative wrote back. 
and that gives us a measure of responsiveness on the representative. And we asked them if it was their first time writing, which gives us, again, a sort of a look at how they're approaching, if this is their first time engaging with the system, or if we're just capturing people who are already writing all the time and now migrating to digital ways. So uh, one of the first things we can do is sort of break down this by different institutions that uh, certain things are more likely to be first contacts. Like people writing to the Lords are very unlikely this to be the first time they're, cor they're corresponding with a representative. They tend to be people like 70% you know, of those people have written to their MP before or written to a council before. These are engaged people by the time you get to write into the Lords. On the other end of the spectrum, most people who write to their local councillor are contacting for the first time. And this similarly sort of no, that's sort of the only one, but that's the majority. Everybody else, most people have already contacted in some way with uh, MPs and then uh, the Lords being at the bottom of that thing, including um, roughly in there the MEP, which sort of works in a strange way in this system. Um, so the other way of looking at it is the other question, asking if your representative wrote back. No, I'm still looking at Sorry, I've, I've, I've missed the slide. Uh, so the other way is approaching it within those um, systems so there are different kinds of representatives. So for like the, Scot the Scottish Parliament, National Assembly for Wales, and London Assembly, you get two kind of representatives. Uh, one elected directly through constituencies and the other elected via PR lists. And these, it's a bit different behaviors um, in, the, in, terms, in responsiveness to communication. We've got a paper exploring this out uh, shortly, hopefully it's just been approved. Um, but it's essentially people who are representing constituencies rather than areas and so are elected directly by voters rather than indirectly through parties are more responsive to communication. And in the area, in the Scottish Parliament, where we have enough data to isolate that from other factors, so we can written say it's not a factor of being part of the government, it's not a factor of uh, various things about tenure of the representative, that still stands out as a factor. So there is different um, uh, kinds of representative are communicating with the constituents in different ways. And this isn't necessarily a judgment on that they're doing a good or a bad job. It's simply that they see their role differently. Certainly in the Scottish Parliament, the uh, regional representatives tend to sort of see their role as being more on policy, more on committees, and so de-emphasize the constituency, constituency nature of their work. So this sort of, sort of validates that aspects of the political system can be extracted from responsiveness, which is an angle you usually get. You have to usually start the other way around. Uh, similarly, we can apply the idea of deriving uh, gender from name to the right uh, them database, and we can extract, uh, roughly speaking, demographics. Again, it's, it's vague, but it's good enough that we, over a very large set of data, we can make judgments on it. So when we look at the, uh, when people write to their MP, we can see this is roughly speaking the story we usually tell about civic tech. It is, you know, there is a, there is a balance, but it is a mostly male thing. And similarly, when we apply, because for right to them data, we have postcodes, we can map postcodes to the low super output areas and get measures of deprivation. And similarly there, generally speaking, there is a gradual increase in more deprived areas, there are less people right to their MP, in well-off areas, there are more. There is a spread, it's not you know, completely one way or the other, but you can see the increase in the data. The interest, so here is a sort of weird figure. I haven't quite got a good theory in this one yet, but looking at the hour of the day, people are reporting, uh, are writing to the, their MP, and then splitting it by gender. You get this weird effect that women are sisterly more like less likely to write to their MP during the night, which means men are sisterly more likely to write to their MP during the night. Obviously, most people are writing during the day. It's just an odd thing that popped out of the data. So not entirely sure what to make of that yet, but there is clearly a sort of, this would speak to a certain pattern of people writing to their MP and this will sort of be explained by that sort of difference in the two genders. These will, in turn, be breakable down into different kinds of behavior when people want to contact their MP. Uh, when we look at the local councils, though, there is far more equally balanced. So roughly speaking, this is still very slightly more male, but it's within the fuzziness of the gender analysis that roughly speaking, we can say, when people write to the local councillors, roughly speaking, we get an equal number of men and women writing. And when we look at the demographic breakdown, there are more people writing from more deprived areas when they write to their local council. And when we move away from the index of multiple deprivation, which is combining multiple different kinds of issues, and look just at crime, there is an incredibly clear pattern going downwards that this is the kind of thing. I mean, obviously, this maps against other issues as well. But roughly speaking, this seems a quite clear pattern of not just uh, that this is perhaps one of the issues people are writing to their representatives about. That is a leap beyond which the data can really support. But it's, it's quite suggestive that people are concerned with their local areas, and that's why they're writing. So this is 
generally speaking, getting at some of the issues we're sort of finding with civic tech websites is that when we sort of survey our users and sort of find what kind of people are taking part in them, if we don't subdivide by use, we might end up with the wrong answer. For instance, if yeah, write to them was just about writing to your local councillor, we'd be very, very happy in general with the demographics of the website. The fact that you can also write to your MP skews it the other way. And so we had to sort of think about the different uses, the different kind of patterns of use we can get out of this stuff. And similarly, uh, to sort of backtrack that it's difficult to work out how to resolve some of these demographic issues. So for instance, the uh, fact that on Fix My Streets, different genders report different kinds of problems. We sort of consider it as a bad thing that the site is not demographically balanced. But that sort of reflects that our, you know, our different genders encountering different problems at different stages in their day and are they more likely to encounter some problems more than others? And if so, the genderedness happens far before they ever reach the website. And so what can we do to correct that problem at that stage? It's not entirely clear if there's an easy answer to that. It is a more general social problem that we then pick up as a result on several bits down the, uh, down the, down the way. So this is just to sort of talk a bit about how I'm approaching investigating this at the moment. So uh, one of the things, essentially I've been building a series of data exploration websites that allow me to sort of pour all this sort of demographic data in and then various other factors in to quickly tell me what areas are and aren't statistically significant, sort of get a better idea of where we should go do more qualitative investigation of what's happening. So in this case, uh, this is looking at, um, Yes, the different kinds of uh, interactions in right to them data. I've got a similar thing for Fix My Street that covers a lot of the same ground as your talk. And it's a sort of a very nice way of being able to click around a lot. And my hope for these is, so we published one last year looking at um, the F our FOI website, uh, what do they know? And essentially the hope is to build these exploration sites, do a quick report on what we're finding inside the data, what we're finding that's interesting, and then release these sites alongside their report. So it's mostly so we can explain the weirdest stuff, uh, where the interpretation, the obvious interpretation might be slightly misleading, and then have more of this data available publicly for people to draw conclusions from and further research to happen on. And that's that, thank you all.